and we're going to talk a little bit about rotational inertia or moment of inertia. Inertia is a resistance to a change in motion. So for linear motion, inertia is actually measured as mass because the more mass an object has, the more resistant it is to a change in its motion. Rotationally, it's not just about the mass, but it's also about where the mass is located, how the mass is distributed. So for a particle, the inertia is equal to the mass times r squared, where r is the distance from the axis of rotation. So mr squared. If we have a collection of particles, then the inertia is simply the sum of mr squared. You simply add the mr squared for each piece in the system, and that will give you the total inertia. For example, if I have an axis of rotation here, and I have a two kilogram particle here, located three meters away, and I have a six kilogram particle here, located 1.5 meters away, and I want to find the total inertia of this system. The inertia would be the sum of the mr squareds, so that would simply be two times three squared plus six times 1.5 squared. So that's going to be two times nine is 18, and six times 2.25 is 13.5. And so I get from my total inertia, then add those two together, I get 31.5. Now what are the units of inertia? Well, mass units are kilograms, and distance units are meters, so squared, kilogram meter squared. So 31.5 kilogram meter squared, that is my inertia for this two particle system. Now, for finding the moment of inertia of a solid rotating object, it's a little bit more challenging. So it's the same idea where you take, say I've got some, some kind of solid object here, and it's going to rotate on an axis like so. Then it's the same principle. So I take each little piece of the system, and I'm going to take m mass of this piece times the r squared of this piece, I'm going to add them all up. But the way that works with a solid object that it has infinitely many pieces, this becomes an integral. So what I end up with is i equals the integral of r squared dm. Integral r squared dm. So dm is the infinitely small piece of mass. It's the mass of my little particle, and then r squared. So the r, which is the distance from the axis of rotation to the little piece of mass, and so I do r squared dm. So notice that in the case of a ring or a hoop, right? if it's just a little hoop here and like so, then the you know the axis of rotation passing right through the middle, so it's going to basically be spinning on it on it like this. If all of the mass is the same distance away, then R becomes a constant, and in an integral you can pull a constant out. So then what I have here for the hoop becomes then r squared times the integral of dm. And the integral of dm, when I add up all the little pieces of mass, I get the total mass. So for a hoop, I end up with just r squared times m, or m times r squared. That is the inertia of a hoop. Now there are some other solid shapes uh, for which there's a nice little formula for finding the moment of inertia. And these shapes are a uniform solid cylinder, so if I have a solid cylinder, uh, axis of rotation passing through the center of the cylinder like so, and then out the bottom, and this is a cylinder of mass m and of radius r, then the inertia of a cylinder is equal to one half mass of the cylinder radius of the cylinder squared. If I have a uniform solid sphere, my attempt at drawing a sphere. <laughs> Axis of rotation passing through, and so it's basically spinning on an axis that passes through the center there. Then the inertia of a sphere, it happens to be two-fifths m r squared, where m is the mass of the sphere and r is the radius of the sphere. So cylinder, one-half m r squared, sphere, two-fifths m r squared. As, as we learned before, the ring or the hoop 
where all of the mass is equidistant from the axis of rotation from the center, then we know that that is in fact just mr squared, right? So that's one that we should know. And then there is a uniform solid rod if the axis is passing through the center of the rod. So this is a rod of mass m and of length l. Then the inertia of the rod axis through the middle is going to be 1 twelfth ml squared. So that's for a uniform thin rod. And that same uniform thin rod, I can spin it on an end instead. Okay, so again, it's a mass m length l rod. If I spin it through an axis passing through the end, so I of a rod through the end, it turns out that one is one third ml squared. So those are some of the formulas for the inertia of various solid shapes. So sometimes we don't always get a nice easy axis of rotation that passes through the center, but sometimes there is an axis uh, that is parallel to one that passes through the center. So let me give you an example. So suppose I take my cylinder and instead of rotating it on an axis through the middle, I instead I want to rotate it on an axis that passes tangent to an edge, but it's, it's still parallel to the axis that would pass through the middle. Right? So the axis through the middle, remember, the inertia for the axis through the middle is one half mr squared. So if I want to find the inertia of the axis here that is parallel to an axis which passes through the center of mass, in fact, let's just call that ICM, center of mass. So this axis is parallel to one which does pass through the center of mass for which I know the inertia. Then there is a theorem called the parallel axis theorem, and it states I parallel is equal to I center of mass plus mh squared. Now in this formula, h is the distance from axis of rotation to the center of mass. So let's take a look at how this works for the cylinder. So if I look at the cylinder, if, if the axis that I want, the parallel axis, is here on the edge, the I center of mass, right? I center of mass is 1 half mr squared plus the mass of the cylinder times h squared. Now h in this case would be from the center of mass to this parallel axis happens to be the radius. And so I can see the inertia then for this axis, this parallel axis, would be 1 half mr squared plus mr squared. And when I add those together, I get 3 halves mr squared. So this is going to be the inertia of a cylinder for an axis that is tangent to an edge and parallel to the axis that passes right through the center of mass like that. Now another example of this uh, would be, let, let's look at the uniform rod. Uniform rod, axis through the center, as we know the inertia is going to be, I'll we'll call that center mass inertia, is 1 12th ml squared. So uh, if I want to look at the inertia at the end of the rod, now we've learned that it's one-third, right, ml squared. Only that was just something that was given to us. And so let's actually prove it. So we'll put a little question mark there. So if I look at the parallel axis here, so the inertia through the end is going to equal the inertia center of mass plus mh squared. So if I'm looking now at an axis through the end, right, then the inertia through the end equals center of mass inertia, which is one-twelfth ml squared plus m times h squared. Now, from the center of mass to the end of the rod is one half the length. I'm going to call that L over 2. So I've got inertia center mass, 1 12th ml squared, plus m times half the length over 2. That is an L. So when I square that out, I get 1 12th ml squared plus 1 4th ml squared. And a twelfth plus a fourth, let's do our fractions here, so that's one twelfth common denominator is going to make that three twelfths. One twelfth plus three twelfths is four twelfths, which is in fact one third ml squared. So we can see how the parallel axis theorem shows us that the inertia of a rod through the end, axis through the end, is going to be one third ml squared. I hope this has helped you understand a little bit better about rotational inertia, or as it's also called, moment of inertia.